Psalm 119 for tonight, verses 145 through 160. And I'm calling this teaching, I Cry Out. Let's pray. Father, uh, with a title like that, I Cry Out. Lord, I, I would imagine, Father, that Holy Spirit, the way you work and the way I know you work is that you brought people here tonight to listen to this message who are in a place where they are crying out to you in one regard or another. And so, Father, I pray that uh, through this night, by your Holy Spirit, you would teach us how to cry out to you and for what to cry out to you and how to do it in faith. We're trusting you, Lord God, as we approach these verses, knowing that you are a God of loving kindness. I pray, Father, you just draw us all in under the wings of the Holy Spirit and bless each heart, I pray. I pray this in Jesus' name, everybody says, Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right, from Psalm 119, verse 145, we could actually see the end of Psalm 119. Can you see it? Yeah. We're not there, but you could see it from here, as they say. And what a wonderful journey it is for us to be able to travel through this. And uh, Lord willing, uh, if it be the Lord's will, we'll come to the end of Psalm 119 next week. It's such a great prayer. It's all about the Lord. It's all about his word. Uh, I think that uh, practically every verse speaks about the word in some regard. But for sure, every single verse speaks about the Lord or makes reference to the Lord. So this is about the Lord and his word. So let me just read through these first eight verses for tonight, and then we'll travel through them together. Here we go. 145. I cry out with my whole heart. Hear me, O Lord. I will keep your statutes. I cry out to you. Save me, and I will keep your testimonies. I rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. I hope in your word. My eyes are awake through the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Hear my voice according to your loving kindness, O Lord. Revive me according to your justice. They draw near who follow after wickedness. They are far from your law, but you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. Concerning your testimonies, I have known of old that you have founded them forever. And as we spoke about last week, that forever means on into eternity. And we're to know that every time we touch the word of God, we are touching a piece of eternity. It's quite remarkable. I want you to see the tone of this. I think you've already caught it, but there in verse 145, it says, I cry out. In 146, it says, I cry out to you. In 147, it says, I cry for help. In 149, it says, hear my voice, O Lord, and revive me. Psalm 119 is a very long psalm indeed, and it hits on practically every emotion that you can have just within this one psalm, from great joy to great despair, from hope to fear to sorrow. I mean, it's a synopsis, I would say, in many regards, of the entirety of the word, and that being the case in an entirety of our whole lives. You're in Psalm 119, one way or another, and... I believe that as he is approaching the end of this long psalm, he begins to give us kind of the bottom line of his prayer. So I don't see in these verses where he's spending much time giving explanation, but rather pulling from throughout the psalm different portions and then just throwing it out there and just throwing it out there. Kind of like when you and I pray to the Lord from a place of hurt, oftentimes we don't use a lot of words. Sometimes we just maybe use one word. What would that word be? 
help. <laughs> and followed by a lot of, uh, oh, oh, please, you know, grunting and groaning. Now listen, uh, grunting and groaning is a perfectly respectable prayer. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, in the Bible it tells us in the New Testament that uh, the Holy Spirit actually makes sounds for us uh that are unutterable you know things you, there aren't even words for the things that the holy spirit can express through us to the lord isn't that comforting mm -hmm. because sometimes we don't even know where we're at we don't even know what we're up to we don't even know particularly the whole picture but we know that god does and listen if you could just bring god grunts uh, i believe that he receives those the other part of prayer that's mentioned here he says i cry out i think there's tears here in this first eight verses don't you and let me tell you something tears are also a legitimate prayer tears are a prayer don't think that you're just crying and they're not going any place because the word of god also tells us that god collects your tears so i don't know all that's behind that and all the deep meaning of it but i do know this that when you're really feeling deep emotion and you don't have words to express it oftentimes all that comes out is a tear and that emotion and all that's drawn into that tear having come out is something that god says i'm collecting that and each one of us knows that you only collect things that are precious to you <laughs> you collect things that are valuable to you things that mean something of import to you and so you can know that those tears that you cry before god are important to him they are valuable to him i almost feel like the lord collects those and then has this sense about him that i'm going to protect these tears that you've cried now oftentimes when we cry Nobody knows where that tear comes from except for you and your soul and the Lord himself. Wonderful. It becomes to you or can become to you something that is highly personal in your relationship with God. Why do I belabor this point? Because I've been there. David has written in the Psalms, boy, I had to get up in the morning and I had to wring out my pillow. You know? I thought my bed was a swimming pool. <laughs> thought I'd come to this insurmountable place in my life. But God knows the, all those things and he carries them and they're precious to him. Now as we go through this psalm, particularly the first eight verses, I want to let you know that there is faith in these verses. This isn't a just woe is me, what a great trouble I'm in, what are you going to do about it? There is faith in here because I read in the lines here an expectation that God, the one being cried out to, will answer. And I think you'll see that as we go through it. I'll tell you that there are plenty of things worth crying about and crying over to a loving God who wants to move in our lives. This is a good place for an amen. Amen. <laughs> God wants to move in your life. I think if we could, if we could, it would be really good to have the sense that whatever it is that's going on in our lives, to know that we are completely safe, free, accepted, to drop every veil between ourselves and God. And I don't know if you've taken, and, and I believe you have to go to that place. Don't, don't let your faith become religious in the sense that I've said my prayers, I've recited my prayers, and now I've got to deal with my troubles. Uh, let it be far more real than that. Real to the extent and to the point to where you are just open and raw before God. Hasn't David taught us that in the Psalms? <laughs> and that guy was called a man after God's own heart. So it's well within, and I well encourage you to cry out. I cry out is the teaching here. So let's go to it. Psalm 145 says, I cry out with my whole heart. And that's the idea right there. Whole heart means nothing is left out. Uh, we might say today, 
uh, I cry out full on, or I cry out holding nothing back. And then he continues, hear me, O Lord, I will keep your statutes. Now, uh, this is a very Jewish thing, but here it is. The idea of God hearing you is the idea of God answering you. Okay? We might think in our vocabulary and culture, did you hear what I said? <laughs> you know, just meaning, was it auditory? Did you catch the words? But not in the Jewish mind and not in the Bible in the Old Testament. When it says, God, hear me, it is meaning that he hears in a sense that now he's going to rise up and respond to it. So this almost, that I'm calling this faith when he says, hear me. Because there's built-in expectation of an answer from God. It comes of faith. So verse 146, he repeats it. I cry out to you. It's kind of a, this repetition speaks of intensity, doesn't it? <laughs> In fact, if somebody's really intense about something and they're talking to you, don't they repeat it several times? And then what do you say? I heard you the first time. <laughs> or to your kids, I heard you the first 50 times. <laughs> but here is somebody who's crying out to the Lord. He says, I cry out to you, save me, and I will keep your testimonies. I, th by the way, this is not a, what's that word, quid pro quo, quo, qu quid pro quo. He's not saying, if you'll answer me, then I'll keep your testimonies. He's saying, save me because I'm going to keep on keeping your commandments. This isn't a, this is I'm keeping your commandments. This is like, save me and I'll just keep on like this, is what he's saying. His desired outcome is to be delivered from the trouble over which he is crying out. Now, you may be here today and you may be crying out for your kids or your grandkids or your wife <laughs> or your husband. You may be crying out for somebody else, but the cry has the same, uh, you know, the same uh, desired outcome uh, that God steps in and either yourself or the person that you're crying out for is delivered. Let's see if this is right. Anybody here crying out for some yourself or somebody else? We got some. Okay, good, good. That's good. So pay close attention then. I am. I'm, I'm crying out for somebody. So as you're looking at this, let it be like your roadmap. <laughs> it's like, okay, this the rest of this week or however long, I'm going to keep crying out for either myself and the trouble I'm in or somebody else I know and the trouble that they're in. And I am going to, I am going to take uh, from this towards the end of Psalm 119 and I'm going to apply it to my crying out and I'm going to take the extra liberty that I see displayed in this psalm and display it towards that for which I'm crying out. Does that make sense? Verse 147, I rise before the dawning of the morning and I cry for help. I hope in your word. See that? I cry out for help and then I hope in your word. It tells me that the person who is writing this has gone through various places in the scripture knowing where God has given help. Right? So he's like, I cry out for help, I hope in your word, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this little parenthesis here, because I've seen you help so many other times. So that's where I'm going to put my hope. Uh, um, I think we've all been to verse 147, and like I say, some of us might be there uh, tonight. Uh, this rising before the dawn in order to cry for help uh, is it kind of interesting. It's, uh, you can ask the question, well, to do this, you know, this, that's going to cost me something. And I say, yeah, it is. It's going to cost you some sleep. You know, when we do the uh, time changes, you know, uh, sometimes we, uh, we spring ahead, right? And we lose an hour. So 
All I'm suggesting is that it not be by law, but by your great desire to see God answer your prayer request, that you go home and you set your clock, you spring forward on your clock so that it goes off an hour earlier and you just give that up specifically to crying out. You see, sometimes somebody will come to me and they'll, they're crying out and they have this problem and I say, have you prayed? And sometimes you'll just get a blank look of, you know, like, you know, like either it says to me like, well, it's not that bad yet, or I don't know what it is, but it's like, have you prayed? Well, kind of, sort of, you know, <laughs> I was hoping you'd do it. That's your job, isn't it? Aren't you a professional? <laughs> so uh, rise up early in the morning. Uh, uh, it will be effective. Uh, I can tell you this, time alone with God is never wasted. But time away from God is always wasted. <laughs> uh, my days are better when I start out with my very first thoughts and prayers. Lord, I guess I'm still here. <laughs> so, Lord, take over this day. Because I know that on my own, by myself, I could really mess this day up. So, Lord, take over this day. Be my God. I want to be your son and walk with you. Sometimes just something that simple can set your day right. You know, like, you know, I know some of us here have gone to a chiropractor, get your back straightened out, right? Well, prayer is a spiritual chiropractor that can get your back straightened out as far as the Lord is concerned. Okay, then he says, I, huh? Exactly. You've got to have the word of God in you. Mike, you're reading my notes. Oh, <laughs> because. <laughs> Same teacher. <laughs> you know, Mike, Mike and I were assistant pastors together back in 1988. And we've been working together since then. And so we're like an old married couple. Sometimes we can answer each other. <laughs> I know what he's thinking before he says something. You know, he does the same thing to me. He'll come up to me sometimes after service. He goes, by the way, I knew you were going to go to those three references or whatever I was, you know. <laughs> but he says, I hope in your word. And then, Mike, here we go. Two things I want to share. Number one, you have got to know the word in order to hope in it. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> How can you hope in that which you don't know? <laughs> and so it's great to give the entire counsel of God. Number two, hope is only as good as that in which it is placed. Ooh, isn't that a good one? So careful where you put your hope. <laughs> Those are good. Those are two good ones, huh? Okay, 148. My eyes are awake through the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Okay, I would say that verses 47 and 48 in a great sense are a definition, a definition of not just waiting on the Lord, but this is a definition of what I would call actively waiting on God. How do I actively wait on God? Well, we're going through it. I cry out. I rise in the morning. I meet with God. I cry out for help on that. And then I stay up as the Lord would call me to do. And there are times... Wait, I know I'm not alone. Haven't you like prayed all night? We've got any of those? You know, we have, haven't we? Because we are actively waiting upon God. And what we are actively waiting for, we've already gotten it, that God will hear us. And God's definition of hearing is to answer, for him to take action. So... This person who is actively waiting on God as they cry out for him because they're in a desperate situation is the one who is up early and also perhaps up late as well. Now, I personally am much better at being awake through the night watches than I am at rising before the dawn. <laughs> Some folks <laughs> have been made by God the other way around. 
I don't understand them. But they don't understand me. <laughs> My wife is uh, up before the dawn, and I'm uh, up late at night. So there you have it. There are times when a verse of scripture, this, okay, here's what happens to me. Literally, this happens to me maybe once a month, and you can ask my dear wife. I'll go to bed, and I'll be laying there, while eyes wide open, and I'm thinking about some verses that just, uh, and I'll say it this way. You know, you know at the end of Psalm 23 where it says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow after me all the days of my life? <laughs> Sometimes verses just follow after me. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? And then I'll be laying there and I'll go, okay, if I just kind of like, this is my thinking. If I just kind of like solve the riddle of what these verses mean and what they mean to me, then I'll be able to go to sleep. <laughs> and I need to do it the next five minutes. <laughs> so I'll be thinking about these verses and just pounding away at them. And, you know, it could be two or three o'clock in the morning. And then it's like the Lord comes, the Holy Spirit comes over, taps me on the shoulder, and the Holy Spirit goes, Paul, would you like me to teach you through those verses? And I go, oh, yes, Lord, I really would. And I actually get happy about it. And then I get up at 2 or 3 in the morning, <laughs> and I go off to my word, and I study. What do those words mean? And then the Lord speaks to me, and those have been some of the very best and special times of my whole life. Absolutely not kidding you. But... Here's what I want to say. I know that because I've responded to that. And the only way that you'll know that it's true and a blessing to meet with God is if you do it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. When the Holy Spirit prompts you to stay up late or to get up early, do it. See if you don't like, like it. That, that the Holy Spirit is right there with you. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Hmm? You go to a place, you find a good ice cream, what do you do? You come back next week or more often. <laughs> Same thing with the Lord. You go, well, Lord, that was a special time. So praise God. Verse uh, 149, hear my voice. There he is again. That's I cry out, according to your loving kindness. O Lord, revive me. I'm going to add to this revive me a little bit. Revive me like a man who's sleeping. Bring me around like somebody who's unconscious. Cause me to stir. Bring me back to life. And then look what he puts at the end of this. Come on, tell me who's shocked about that. He wants God to do it according to your justice. Wait a minute. Let me think about God's justice for a minute. Isn't it like a consuming fire? Isn't God's justice thorough and complete? I look at that word justice and I think to myself, now haven't I stood up here before you and said, don't pray for justice. Instead, pray for mercy, right? And pray for grace. But this psalmist said, pray for justice. Now, this then is the one time and the one place where you can actually pray for justice. But to you and to me, follow me on this one, gang. For you and me, when we cry out for justice, it has an entirely different meaning than if somebody in the world did it. You see, when we cry out for justice, from God, what we are doing is we are believing that God has brought us to a place in our lives where we recognize that we are lost without him, that we are desperately guilty for our sins. Has God brought you to that place? God brings us to that place, and then he brings in his justice. How does he do that? But by sending Jesus Christ as our substitute to pay the penalty for our sins because he was the perfect sacrifice. So death couldn't hold him. The grave couldn't stop him. He rose from the dead as our living savior and he paid the price. That's God's justice. God's justice is to look at you 
and to put Jesus in your place and have him die upon the cross. Amen? Amen. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse us and allow us to stand in front of God's justice. Verse 150, they draw near who follow after wickedness. They are far from your law. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. These two verses together, 150, 151, paint a really wonderful picture. Let me see if I can capture the picture that I believe these two verses are giving us together. Here we go. Lord, save me, revive me, because those who are not after you, not after righteousness, are all about wickedness. They're closing in on us with various legislations and cultural changes. But Lord, you are the near one. Oh Lord, you are near. They draw near, but you are ever present with me. Do you see that? So those verses paint that picture. They give us a beautiful contrast. They're drawing near, but you're the near one who has promised to never leave me nor forsake me. Look, so can you see this? That this person is crying out with their hurts and pains. They're including faith in the mix because they expect God to hear and respond. They're willing to actively wait upon God, right? And now what they are doing is they are, um, let's see, how can I say this? They are proclaiming the nature of God. They are proclaiming the nature of God. He talked about God's loving kindness. Now he talks about the fact that God is near and ever present. See, include these things in your prayer. I mean, just pray these eight verses over that for which you're crying. Go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm crying over X, Y, Z. And then just read those verses and let the truth of those verses fill your heart. 152 says, concerning your testimonies, I have known of old that you have founded them forever, meaning into eternity, meaning your word is permanent. Your word is stable. Your word is secure. Your word is my rock. Your word is my anchor in an ever-changing world. Did you hear that 70s fashions are coming back again? I just heard that on the news the other day. So, ladies, you can wear your white boots. <laughs> okay, here we go. 153. Consider my afflictions and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. I, I like this because... What it's telling me, or what it's showing me, is just this beautiful reliance upon God. And, and, and I have deep uh, respect and appreciation for anybody who's in a hard place, but yet they continue to trust God. Have you met some of those folks? Isn't it awesome to talk to somebody like that? I've gone to hospital beds where I've been like, you know, walking down the corridors and I'm thinking, oh Lord, what can I share? How can I encourage this person? And oh Lord, give me the words to lift them up and I just want to bless them. And then I get into the room and the Lord does a total flip-flop and the person lying there in bed in a crushed state of one kind or another is ministering to me, telling me about the goodness of God, telling me about the grace of God, telling me about the presence of the Holy Spirit telling me about who they shared a Jesus with there in their bed. And I'm just like, oh, Lord, you know, thank you for turning that around on me. This person says, consider, asking the Lord to consider. You're asking who to consider. You're asking the creator, all wise, all knowing, all present, sees the beginning of the parade and the end of the parade all at once. God, would you consider? Now, I don't know what it would take or what is all employed in God considering something. But I'll bet it's a lot, don't you think? Every angle, every possible view, upside down, inside out, right side up, in the short term, in the middle term, in the long term, in the thought of eternity, he sees it all at once. And I say, God, I'm trusting your ability to consider my affliction and to deliver me 
in your timing. And regardless of what takes place, I want you to know I'm not going to forget your law. I'm not going to forget your word. I'm not going to forget you, Lord. My thoughts, my meditations are upon you. Look at verse 154. This is interesting. So 153 seems as though it is appealing to a sovereign God. But 154 says, plead my cause. This is found in other Hebrew writings and it refers to somebody who is acting as your representative. Acting as your lawyer. Plead my cause. Now wait a minute. I just asked God, to, sovereign God, to consider my affliction. And then I turn around and pray, plead my cause. Can you see how those don't seem as though they fit? But boy, do they fit beautifully. Because look what it says. Plead my cause and redeem me. So the pleader of the cause is the one in whom is the hope of redemption. Is anybody with me on this? <laughs> Okay, then on the count of three, you tell me who this is talking about. One, two, three. Jesus! <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Plead my cause and redeem me. Uh, revive me according to your word. Okay. Uh, look, anytime you, see, anytime you see the word, the word in the scriptures, you can replace it with Jesus, can't you? Because Jesus is the word. The word is with God. The word was God. The word made flesh, dwelt among us, right? That's what it says in John chapter 1. Revi okay, plead my cause. So I must be talking to an advocate of one kind or another. Plead my cause and redeem me. I must understand that this uh, advocate has the ability to redeem me. That means buy me out of whatever trouble I'm in. Revive me. This, uh, this uh, advocate who has the ability to buy me out of my trouble can also bring me back to life. I think that's kind of like being born again. I don't know, what do you think? Revive me according to your word. Speaking to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the word became flesh. This is just beautiful. Come on, you gotta dig this. <laughs> I love the word. I love to plead the cause. Hebrews chapter four, verses 14 through 16. Let me read it to you, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Seeing then, that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly, that is confidently, to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Isn't that lovely? That's the God you call out to. Come on, I'm, I, I'm calling out to you right now. Lift up your faith. Who's the God that you serve? Didn't we sing in worship time? Yahweh, Yahweh. We love to shout your name, oh God. Come on. I know this thing's pressing in on you. I know it's more than you can take. So does God know it. But I want you now to have some courage and come boldly to get the help that you need. Amen? Uh, so, uh, the plead my cause and redeemer is exactly about Jesus and what he does for us. I thought of a verse that we quote often at Christmas time. Out of the book of Isaiah. Chapter... 9 starting in verse 6 <laughs> for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulders his name shall be called wonderful counselor that's a advocate not somebody who counsels you but somebody who represents you his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. 
Come on, you gotta love that. Gee whiz, thank you, Lord. Okay, uh, in giving the uh, not only the uh, the uh, names and in a sense kind of uh, job description of Christ, uh, who he is, an identity uh, reminder of him. It also says what his what his plan is, what his ultimate plan is, and his ultimate plan is to have government, right? The government upon his shoulders. He's in charge. And that's followed by uh, setting up this order and then establishing this order and doing it with judgment and justice from this time forward. Guess what? He wants to do that to every one of us. He wants us to see him as Lord over all. Lord Jesus, I give you the government of my heart and soul. I want you to govern over this and then the lord comes in at right after that and he begins to establish within us an order that talks about what steps do you take and that's out of the word of god and then the steps you take he will establish them meaning make them firm because some of us and it doesn't mean if you're matter if you're a christian for five minutes or 50 years we all need to be established in the things of god that means rock solid established in love and established in forgiveness and established in mercy and established in, in being an example to all the believers just like Jesus is. And so he comes in, establishes that with justice from this time forevermore. That's what he's doing in our lives. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. That's it. Boy, these things all fit together, don't they? Every single part of the word fits together. Okay, here we go. Uh, verse 155 salvation is far from the wicked if you have any problems with that let me ask you when you were one of the wicked was salvation far from you <laughs> pretty far huh meaning none of us on our own could get there <laughs> and nobody can it says for they do not seek your statutes so we have kind of a message don't we <laughs> I think it's called the gospel. But we have a message to people who don't believe, and that's to seek God and live. I mean, enough of us pastors have said it before. It's not rocket science. Seek God and live. Turn from your old life and put your faith in Jesus. He's our all in all. And how about this one? Get Jesus as your lawyer. Oh, that's a good bumper sticker. <laughs> Get Jesus as your lawyer. Uh, verse uh, 156. Great are your tender mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to your judgments. Uh, here the writer is understanding that when God's judgments come, then comes tender mercies to those who love his word and to those who love him. Many are my persecutors and my enemies. I hope, I hope none of you are in that place, but I know that it's a real place. Many are my persecutors and my enemies, yet I do not turn from your testimonies. <laughs> it's kind of like Peter saying, uh, when Jesus said, uh, you know, everybody was leaving, remember? Jesus said, eat my flesh and uh, drink my blood. That means consume all that he is. Uh, a lot of people were like, whoa, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this, I just wanted a few miracles. And uh, off they go. And then Jesus turns to his disciples and says, are you guys going to leave also? And then Peter, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, Lord, where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. And that's what we are sold out to and sold out for. Jesus Christ who has the words of eternal life. So it really doesn't matter if we suffer persecution from our family or persecution at work or persecution at, at school or persecution from the culture. Jesus would say the same thing. Are you going to leave? No way, Lord. You have the words of eternal life. Verse 158. I see the treacherous and am disgusted and, and am disgusted because they do not keep your word he is confirming i believe his choice to follow after god 
and he's kind of like here's what I think I think he's like he's looking at two different camps and we could do that today can't we especially with all the uh, you know all the speeches and all the you know campaigning and the presidential stuff you can really look and see very well defined camps <laughs> and you go well that's the camp of the world and this is the camp of the Lord and I'm looking over there and it just disgusts me so anybody had that reaction you just kind of go I don't believe that's against the law and they didn't get oh well, okay you know what I mean uh, you just go I, I'm disgusted by what I this is crazy so let me give you the example though uh, for our lives and how it pertains to us is if we kind of like dabble a little bit in the world and we dabble a little bit in the Lord and we really haven't pledged allegiance to either camp so Jesus said you can't serve two masters you'll love one and hate the other hate one love the other but some people like to play this middle ground where they're politically correct or what, how, whatever terminology you may use they don't want to offend anybody so they're kind of halfway in the camp of the world and halfway in the camp of the Lord. You know, here's another example. Uh, you know, say some sports athlete. He, uh, his contract is up with the team that he's with. He decides not to re-sign with that team, but to sign with some other team, right? Somebody gives him a big signing bonus, you know. And so uh, uh, they have the press conference and they show the new jersey, right, that this one's going to wear. And, they, and he puts the new jersey on, okay? It would be like him showing up at spring camp or wherever, wearing the old jersey at the new camp. How do you how, how do you think that would go? Not very well, huh? Somebody would say to him something like this: uh, "Excuse me, uh, you don't play for that team anymore. <laughs> you're not allowed to wear that jersey anymore, Christian. You you don't belong to that camp anymore." Uh, 20 years ago, Mike did a sermon called I Don't Live There Anymore. Remember that? <laughs> and Mike talked about his old life and his old uh, 67 Mustang with four on the floor and, uh, <laughs> and the other rowdy things that he used to do. And then he said he drove by his old house and said, I, the thought hit me, I don't live there anymore. I don't live there. I don't go that way. I don't do that things. You know what I mean? I, that's what we're saying here and that's what I think that he's saying. Verse 159. Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. Uh, another way that can be translated is steadfast love or even grace. The Hebrew word is hasid. In fact, let's have everybody say hasid together. Hasid. Oh, okay. That's a beautiful word. It means God's steadfast love for you. Hasid. Verse 160. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. That means they're all eternal. Okay. W w the way that this is written, the what it is saying is... Uh, that the sum of all your word is truth. Kind of like this. You read through the word of God, you read through the whole word of God, you go, oh, well, that's true. Oh, that's true. Oh, that's true. And oh, that's true too. And oh, that one's true as well. And if you take all those and line them all up, put plus signs next to all of them, draw a line at the bottom, underneath it says truth. All of your word is truth. Can you tell me somebody else whose name is truth? I am the way, the... <laughs> is Jesus in the Old Testament or is it just me? <laughs> He's the key to all the scriptures, isn't he? He's right there. He just like pops off the pages to us, you know? Uh, so thank you, Lord all the sum of your word is truth father i ask that you would bless my brothers and sisters on this beautiful warm night lord that you provided for us warmth in your word lord and i pray father that for those right now in particular that are going through uh, a real trial of a time
who are troubled, pressed believers, Lord. These are troubled, pressed believers. And together, collectively in our hearts, Father, those in that place say to you, Lord, I call out to you. I call out to you for help. I ask that you would revive us, Lord, by your loving kindness, by your Hasid, Lord. We're trusting in you, Father. And we're asking, Lord God, that we would that you would hear us. And in hearing us, you would stand up, take action, and answer us in our prayers. For we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. And all my dear brothers and sisters say, Amen. Amen.